Hello, everybody. Uh, it's me again, Jake, the voice behind Break the Mold Studios Equine Art. And today I am showing you the second part of my sculpture work on the Mustang Marin Full pair that I was working on in my first video. Um, <clears throat> I'm really only going to be working on the mare today but I feel like there's a lot of interesting sculpture and uh, and interesting tips and tricks that I can show you throughout this part where I'm adding details and um, moving things, so uh, let's get into it. Um, I cut out a piece of video from the beginning of this, um, which wherein I, I was trying to make the ears uh, face backwards and then realized that it didn't really give off the matronly motherly vibe that I wanted her to have. She looked pissed off and also the ears looked terrible. So I cut that out for y'all, but just know that, you know, even people who spend a lot of time doing this and have already released sculptures and stuff make mistakes and make sculpting choices that look stupid and have to go back on them. Um, <clears throat> I feel like editing yourself is a really big part of art, and um, I found a better way of doing things. Um, as you can see, I'm focusing a lot on my reference picture on the left. I talked about the importance of references in my last two videos, so I won't go into it real deep in this one, but I've still kept them there on the side so you can see what I'm looking at while I'm looking at it. Uh, which I think is really important. <clears throat> um, you can also see up at the top I'm listening to forensic files uh, from YouTube while I'm sculpting. Um, I always have to listen to something while I'm sculpting and I usually don't do music because it makes me kind of manic, um, which doesn't help my sculpting sometimes. So um, Forensic Files is really great for me because the format of the show is exactly the same each and every time. Um, and you can really just listen to it instead of looking at it so you're not diverting your attention away from your sculpting. I would not recommend like actually looking, watching um, a show while you're sculpting because I feel like when you're working on a piece of art this detailed, you either need to be looking at it or the reference photo while you're working. If you're diverting your attention to something else, you're gonna get distracted and miss something. Um, <clears throat> I have a large folder of uh, references for this. Uh, shout out to the multiple Mustang um, photograph uh, accounts that I follow on Instagram. Uh, most of these horses that I'm using in the references are from the Sandwash Basin region. Um, I tried to keep my references focused on a specific region of Mustang because the regional um, differences in confirmation are a lot more uh, <clears throat> impactful than you might realize um, because of the mixed bred nature of the Mustangs that from the different areas look completely different. Um, <clears throat> here I had shortened her face because I was looking at these other horses and realized that she wasn't coming off as a Mustang with a long face. She looked more like a warm blood or something. Um, so I was working on that. I uh, use a lot of masking in this particular video. Um, I think it's really important to mask off the areas that you're working on, um, in my opinion, especially if you're not rigging your model, um, because it's very easy to stretch and pull something and accidentally pull something else and not notice it till later and not be able to use the back button, and it sucks. You really have to be careful with your masking, though, because sometimes you'll accidentally mask something you didn't realize you did or not mask something you thought you did, and um, it'll pull a weird part of the horse completely out of proportion and you'll have to go back and fix that and all that and it's really a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, you can see on this model I didn't use the separate meshes for the eyes and I talked about that in a different video and I think it works for this horse but I have since really learned how to do it correctly and I've been doing that more on my sculptures and I like it. Um, it, it helps when you're printing so small, like these horses are meant to be micro minis uh, or bantams, so like one to two inches tall is how tall I'm gonna print these guys. Um, 
you really, really have to carve the detail in deep when you're working on ones that you're going to be printing so small. And I have a problem with that. Um, as you can see, I, I do carve pretty deep on this horse, but I'm probably going to have to go back in before I get her ready to print and do things even deeper to where your eye is uncomfortable. Like your eye will not like how it looks because it'll look a little out of scale. But once you print it, you'll be like, oh, okay, this looks normal because um, on such small scales, the, the printer is slightly less accurate than it is on your screen. So it'll fill in those details a little bit. Um, on this part, I was having trouble picturing her face. And I realized that was because all the Mustang mares that I was looking at have these long forelocks that slope around the sides of their face and cover certain areas. So I decided to add one so that my eye could see this correctly. I usually don't do hair until the very last step of the horse and I didn't put a mane or tail on this um, yet. Uh, but I actually don't like how I did this forelock. Um, I was working on uh, my newest sculpture, Brontes, a while ago and um, <clears throat> actually scrapped his entire mane and tail that I had put on originally because I wasn't happy with it and redid them and they look so much better. Um, I had been using the pull tool and um, the uh, the draw tool, just the regular round draw tool um, to add in hair and it was just not cooperating with me well. I've since learned that um, I like the elastic deform or I, I, I don't know if I'm saying the correct one, but the little swirly one underneath the um, tool I have selected currently on the screen. That one I find is best for um, doing hair because you can just freeform pull the mesh um, into a spaghetti shape to make it into the hair. You do have to remesh before you really mess with it or else um, the polygons will be really triangulated and sharp um, and you don't want that because you don't get as much detail that way. Um, here I'm paying attention to the mare on the screen the way she's holding her legs um, with the knees slightly pointed in. That's actually a, a confirmation flaw of the horse um, but I want to show realism in this sculpture and not perfection. So I copy the stance of the mare. That actually might be because she's just had a foal and has been pregnant for a really long time. Um, but I, I like the little touches like that. It makes them seem real and less plasticky. Um, but at any rate, this mare doesn't end up just standing on all four feet anyway. So I did do adjusting after that. This is just so that I get the right idea. I still have um, uh, X axis mirroring on at the moment. Uh, and I will keep that until I have my base details of the horse in all the way up until I start posing it. That way you get... Um, really symmetrical and even sides of the horse and that's what you want. Uh, I wanted to post another video and work on this even though I should be working on stuff that makes me money <laughs> because I have been getting a couple comments on my Instagram and Facebook pages lately. Uh, people saying stuff like I don't like the way that that looks, hand sculpted stuff looks better, or other people saying, you know, uh, nice, but that's not really art because you did it digitally and you just mocked it up in CAD or something and, uh, you know, <laughs> made the, uh, remeshed the polygons, made them more numerous and then just, you know, added the details on the horse, but that's not what I do. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be argumentative or bitter about any of it, but I really feel like this is an art form, especially for me. I do this because I love it. Um, not because I want to be famous in the hobby or, you know, want to make a lot of money. I don't make enough money on this to really, um, 
have it be worth all the effort that I put into it. I do this because I love it, and I do this because I like to create a character, you know? When I'm working on these horses, they have personalities in my brain, and I just work on them until I feel like those personalities come out of them. And I'm going to show a little bit of how I do that on this mare um, while we're doing the posing, because it's really, really important to have an idea of the, the temperature of the horse and the way that the horse would move um, when you're posing them. Oh, I'm just being babbly today, <laughs> but I, I hope that's okay. Um, here, I'm again looking at my references really closely, adjusting tiny little areas that don't look right. Her back legs look really weird right now, um, and that's because she is camped under. Um, that's what it's confirmationally called. And it looks like I did it unintentionally and like the legs are bad, but it was actually a conscious choice because of the specific confirmation flaw that I've seen a lot in Mustang mares, so I kept it. And once I pose the legs um, to be, I actually use the pose of the reference photo I have open right now. Then I, uh, th then you really see how it works with the way that the horse on the left looks. And now I'm starting the process of masking and um, moving the limbs. I've turned X mirroring off at this point. Um, I added basic details onto everything. Uh, the legs are not as dry and as detailed as I'd like them to be at this point, but that's because out of everything that you move, the legs will get messed up the most when you're using this method. Um, and that, you, you really have to add a lot of the detail back into the legs anyway. So I just do this so that I know that they're the same size and they have the same basic shape, and then I add the individual details onto the legs later. Notice that I am only ever moving these body parts at junctions where they would move on an actual horse. I'm not going to bend it in the middle of the leg, that'll look weird. Um, because that's bones on those horses don't bend, <laughs> so I don't use this tool on them. Uh, I really like this tool. Uh, I have totally forgot what it's called. I think it might be Pose. Um, you always, 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 when you're working with this, have to make sure that you turn the strength of your brush up to 100%. Because if you don't, when you're posing stuff, it'll do like a weird drag thing with the extra area of the horse, and it'll deform it even more than you want it to. So strength should always be at 100% because it means something different for this brush. Um, yes, when I do this, I mess up a lot of the leg. You'll see that in this leg. See how it looks wonky? It has all the folds and stuff. I go back in there with the smooth tool, and I uh, smooth and fill, and then I put the details back on the leg. That's just how I do it. I could rig it, but I feel like a rigging doesn't work nearly as well for a four-legged animal like the horse in the way that I do it and it irritates me. So I do this. If you're irritated with rigging, this is another way to do it. Um, always mask stuff off because anything really that gets in the circle of your pose brush will be moved when you're trying to move things. And, um, Oh gosh, sorry. I keep losing my train of thought. I have short-term memory problems. I have an autoimmune disorder and my brain doesn't like it. So, <coughs> shit. <laughs> Y'all can uh, hear how unprofessional I sound. So right now I'm looking at the photo on the left. I'm posing based on areas of the horse that, you know, the normal horse would move. And I'm moving a little bit at a time and then going back and checking it to the reference, moving a little bit at a time. Sometimes I undo stuff because it doesn't look right. I try to look at all angles. I try to get multiple photos of this pose from different angles, which I happened to get and I was so happy about that. Um, and I want to look at it specifically from the angle that the photo is at because you really want to line up those 
how far apart each of the legs are, what degree are they angling at, you know, is it a 45, is it a not 90, <laughs> obviously, um, 180, I don't know. You really have to picture those things in your mind, and if you can't picture when you look at stuff the space in between it, um, reduce the size of your sculpture to the size of the reference picture, put them in the exact same angle position, and then hold a ruler up and measure them, and just keep your horse the same size and adjust it to the correct angles. Um, I feel like, you know, that's the most important thing when you're posing and when you're sculpting on these is to get them looking accurate. It's easy to go, okay, I'm going to sculpt a horse and try to do one from memory. And you think you know what one looks like, but you really don't know unless you're looking directly at it, in my opinion. So here I'm going to start posing her spine. Now, even though this horse is walking straight forward, you can see in the photo, um, you want to add a spine bend to the horse. Whichever direction that they're moving in, even if it's slightly, even if it's degrees, you want to add some sort of bend into the spine of the horse because that makes it look much more alive. With digital sculptures, and this is something that I respect that, you know, has been a criticism of them from some people, uh, is that they look stiffer. They look more plasticky sometimes. And I understand how that happens, because you don't make the little mistakes with your hands that you do when you're sculpting by hand. Um, you make mistakes on here, but they don't look the same. It's not like a thumbprint or something. It's not like um, a carve mark or something that gives it, you know, a life. Um, so you have to add that in there intentionally. You have to make the person believe that this is something with life in it, character. Um, and adding the bend in the spine, adding a swoop of the hair, adding a little twitch to the eyes or a nostril or some unevenness of the mouth, little lip hanging open, a little swish of the tail, you know, tiny little details like veins and wrinkles on the nose. That's what adds life into sculptures like this. You have to tease the realism out of it. Here I'm working more on bending the spine. I'm moving the hips because I didn't feel like the hips were angled towards the body in the way that I saw them in the reference photos. And I struggle a lot with the hips on this horse because I didn't get a lot of good photos from behind. Um, Mustangs are, you know, obviously wild. People generally aren't taking pictures of their asses. <laughs> um, I could have pulled a reference picture of a different horse from this angle, and I should have, and I probably will when I finish it, but I'm just working with what I have right now, being lazy a little bit. I didn't really work on the foal at all during this uh, video, I just kind of put him in the background and let him hang out, walk behind Mama. I thought maybe I'd get to him later, but... Um, <laughs> this is a video from three separate days where I was working and it ended up being 45 minutes even after I sped it up by 450%. <laughs> so um, this is probably about eight hours of sculpture. Maybe a little bit less than that, but it was it, it's a long time. Um, and there are some gaps in between where I, like, went to the restroom, got a snack, watched some TV or something, and then came back to it, of course. But, uh, you know, for the most part, I kind of buckle down and, and just sculpt something from beginning to end of my session. Um, I have to keep my head in the game. <laughs> Um, here I was using those alignment blocks that you can see to make sure that the legs were roughly the same length. Um, when I go back in to actually finish the details before I get ready to get it ready to uh, print, 
I will go in and, and adjust them so they're like the exact same length minutely because if you scroll in you can get more of those little boxes and just align them together. Um, another benefit to this, be this bend of the spine on this mare, and uh, I may have to do more work on this, but um, since she only has three legs on the ground and one is raised, tipping her head to the other direction will bring weight away from the leg that is unsupported, um, which should help her with the ability to stand better. I may have to camp her legs under her a little bit more to make sure that she can stand, especially that back leg. I um, may have to draw it out a little bit and towards the center of her body um, so that she's really leaning to the side that's supported. And this is a lot that you have to think about when you're working on this. And there are programs that can actually um, interpret the, the weight distribution of the model without you having to even think about it. But I don't have one of those. This is just my, you know, rough going. I usually print one copy as a test and then see how that one stands. And if it doesn't stand well, then I adjust the legs a little bit, um, adjust the weight distribution a little bit, and then um, try another test print and see if that one works. And if that one doesn't, then I panic and cry, but <laughs> um, usually I can get it on the second try. Brontes and his base, I was worried his base wasn't going to support him, but it supported him the first time out first print and I was so happy about that. Winston stands very well. Tater does not. <laughs> Tater is sort of the uh, ugly stepchild sculpture of mine where I'm like, oh, I did not refine him enough before I uh, sent him out to people. But I was kind of rushed. My computer had been down for months. So he's still cute. I still have his file around. I'm probably going to redo it and make him into something different again someday. Um, but I have other stuff I'm more interested in right now. Um, good golly. I, uh, I have mixed feelings about doing photo, uh, videos like these. Um, you know, this is my livelihood. This is my life. I love it. And I like to share it with people. And probably two times a week I have some younger well not maybe younger I'm young but um, some newer hobbyists message me and go hey I love your sculptures what sculpting program do you use um, what's it like what printer do you have I really want to get into this and I love getting those comments or, or messages because it makes me happy that people feel like they can approach me and ask questions. I always try to be open and I always try to be helpful and friendly, but it also makes me feel a little obsolete. Um, there were a couple people doing printing when I first got into this, but the last year has just exploded with people doing digital sculptures and printing them and selling them. And it's wonderful because there are a lot of new sculpture artists in the hobby, a lot of new art to enjoy, a lot of different styles, a lot of new big names, you know. But at the same time, it feels like I have less of a, uh, a stranglehold on the market now. And so you get worried about being able to sell things and uh, being able to continue working. But I'm trying to be as open and as honest about my process as I can, because I think that's just the right thing to do. You know, it's the right thing to be helpful and it's the right thing to be kind um, because you stop the careers of a lot of good artists if you don't help them when they're young, you know. You want this hobby to keep going on, and you want people to continue to love this artistry, and you want people to respect your craft, you know. Um, legitimizing digital sculpture has been a really great boon in the hobby, I think. Um, and it really raises accessibility as well. 
a lot of people who wouldn't be able to afford other stuff are now getting great art because of um, digital sculpture and 3D printing and all of this. And I love that. I really, really love that. Um, so here, oh no, it's the next jump. Um, yes, here. I accidentally forgot to record about an hour <laughs> of sculpting where I sculpted um, some little details on her veins and udders. And no, I did not intentionally not record me sculpting horse boobies. <laughs> but, um, you know what? I'm sure that that will make a few people happy that they didn't have to watch me sculpt horse titties for 45 minutes. <laughs> um, I try to start, strive for realism in my sculptures. So my horses have veins, my horses have wrinkles, my horses have genitals. Um, and I, yes, I do have a folder for, full of horse genital references, and I uh, always get teased about that by my friends and uh, partner, and uh, so <laughs> so that's fun. I'm, I'm the horse genital person, apparently, and no, it's not a thing that anyone should enjoy. <laughs> Definitely not something that I enjoy. But uh, my stepsister likes to send me ads for horse dick shaped dildos just as a joke. And I'm like, Haley, you asshole. Sorry, if you're children, I apologize for this color commentary. This is who I am. <laughs> um, here I'm doing the little hairs on the hooves. I always add those because it looks strange if the hoof capsule is just like flat going into the hoof. I think that looks weird. Even though I didn't hair the rest of the horse, I might go back and add some little fluffies in different places. Um, I do on the back of the feet because Mustangs generally have extra hair there. Um, but I don't love the way these hooves are gonna look. Uh, the bottoms are fine, uh, but the sides, the side walls when you're sculpting micro minis, if you want the hoof to have texture, you have to basically make it look plaid and carve really deep into it and they look stupid in the sculpting program but they print with just enough texture to be able to see the texture on the hooves so it doesn't look as bad once you've printed it but it's gonna look stupid when it's in here and i'm just preparing you for that so you judge me slightly less <laughs> Yeah, I had to search for ho horse hoof bottom uh, because I didn't have the references pulled up. Um, Mustangs have this interesting thing with their hooves where they're rolled at the ends because they're always walking along rocks and stuff. They don't have to have their hooves trimmed because um, they wear them down naturally over the course of just walking in their lives. So I did try to do that with these hooves. Um, yes, that is a decapitated hoof on the left. It's quite gory. I don't know why they just decapitated a horse foot. And I know that's not what it's called. Decapitation is head, but eh, whatever. Here's what I mean about the stupid hooves. You, you want to get the rings around, um, the side and around the edges, and then I smooth it. Um, and I did not like how it looks but it'll show up with just enough detail to be fine. Missy, my kitty, is trying to step on my keyboard. She's being a little asshole. Missy, do not step on my keyboard. She's very good, you guys. I should put a picture of her at the end of this video. She's just precious, and she doesn't meow, either. She just makes little clicky noises. Miss Junebug, are you purring into the microphone? Yes. I'm going to take you off my desk now. Oof. There you go. <laughs> and, um, you know, I continue to sculpt the bottoms of the hooves on ones that I want to be micro minis for whatever reason. Uh, the bottoms of the hooves almost never come out correctly because um, the way that the resin cures... Um, when you're putting supports on the bottoms of the feet, it kind of traps the resin right underneath the feet. And so every time that the other layers get exposed to 
um, UV light, the little resin droplets that are caught underneath the hooves get exposed to, you know, that resin light, um, just slightly. So what it does when you take the supports off is is usually you can see a little bit of the hoof detail underneath but not enough that it looks like much of anything it's it's just like a little line it's weird i don't like it i have combated that somewhat by um changing the way that i put the supports on the bottoms of the hooves and um uh, carving deeper into the bottoms of the hooves when I do them, um, but it doesn't really fix the problem entirely. The bottom part of your horse, um, the part that is facing upward um, when you're printing, is where resin will catch and obscure detail. Missy, no! Off the desk! Little asshole! Um, that's the part that's going to catch resin, anything that's facing upside down. And that resin will kind of fill in the details of your horse. So that's why I always make the bottom part when I'm doing my supports, the stomachs and the feet. Or the stomach, <laughs> the stomach and the feet. Um, because you don't want it to be the top of your horse. It, because if it's okay if you're obscuring a little bit of detail underneath the horse. That's the area that you see the least. But the top of the horse is the part with the head and the back and the tail and all the stuff that you see the most. So printing it that way is counterintuitive. It, it just creates more problems than it fixes, in my opinion. You just have to do the supports correctly and, and hanging them upside down will work fine. I'm sure the people who know nothing about 3D printing are like, what are you talking about? That's so weird. Yeah, I should explain more. I'm going to do another video where I show um, myself supporting Brontes. Um, I recorded that footage. I hope I got all of it. I can't remember. Um, but I, I'll talk about my methods for supporting because that's another really important part of this. There are, are some people who can sculpt, but who cannot figure out how to use their printers correctly and not get um, a bunch of waste out of it. And I get a bunch of second quality pieces out of my printer, you know, occasionally. Sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes you get lazy. Sometimes you just forgot to clean the FEP and your stuff sticks to it and you look like an asshole for wasting resin. But um, you know, it happens to everybody. You just have to be able to troubleshoot when you have issues. Um, and that's why I follow a lot of printer groups on Facebook. Um, I follow, uh, 3D printing groups, and then I follow, uh, printer groups, uh, that are specifically for the brands, uh, and model printers that I have, because each individual one will have, um, triggers and issues and, um, aspects that are individual to the printer that you have to troubleshoot and it's just really helpful to be able to ask a group of other people stuff like that i find facebook to be really good for that i'm not a big facebook fan um it's for old boomer moms obviously <laughs> um but there are some really really good groups there um there's even a 3d printing model horse group um for people who like that um and I find that to be really helpful. Sorry that all my videos are very long-winded. I had to really, really, really speed up these videos. Um, and I didn't want to speed them up any more than this. Or cut them up any more than this. Because I felt like this was, you know, a contained period of sculpting that I wanted to get out together, and I wanted to be able to talk about what I was doing while I was working on it. I feel like maybe my last video I sped it up too much and you couldn't even tell what I was doing. Um, but I hope that you're, you know, sitting, having a good time maybe painting or uh, sculpting yourself or something while listening to me talk. That's what I want out of this video is just for something that you can enjoy and listen to mindlessly because that's the kind of entertainment i love and um 
I hope you get something out of it. I'm adding in wrinkles here, and it's going to cut off the, the wrinkles, but I, I really love doing these. Um, I'm looking a little bit at the reference photo to the left, but it's also just kind of instinctual for me to put these wrinkles in there. Um, I use the draw sharp tool and just think about how the flesh and skin of the horse would kind of pull and stretch um, as they move. It's a little bit like fabric if you're used to doing fabric, but it's thicker. Um, you have to really just kind of inflate it as well. Here I'm looking at the shape of the muzzle on the horse to the left, realizing that hers is too thin. The Mustang mares have kind of this wide but dainty like round muzzle um, that kind of sinks in in the center of the face and I love that and I really want to you know do something that makes complete sense for the breed and I'm gonna tighten up the face a little bit too right now it looks kind of very smooth kind of lumpy um, kind of plasticky so I'm going to do a lot of um, sharpening of things um, all over the horse. I, I do have a tendency to over sharpen the muzzle, uh, muscles. Um, as you can see, the horses on the left have pretty um, soft uh, chest muscles. And I've carved them in pretty deep on this mare. Um, but like I said, again, I'm printing them quite small. You kind of have to with things like that, or they end up looking far too smooth once you've uh, finished them and are ready to print them. But I, um, I carve those in and then I use the fill tool to kind of fill that gap between them. And then I add the wrinkles in the places where the wrinkles need to be. Right under the, the front legs is a really great place to add those. Um, you will see some of this in the micro minis, but I add it to them anyway, because you know if, if your detail comes out at all, that's a win. Um, on the really small horses. And then, you know, if you want to reuse the sculpture again, uh, do a stable mate or, you know, even a traditional size 1-9 um, scale, uh, you'll be glad that you already added those things because they will show up so much better in the larger sizes. And if I do end up going for a larger size with this mare as well, I will redo the texture on the hooves. I will actually like look at a damn hoof and do it right. <laughs> um, same thing I'm talking about with these um, veins. They look far too visible here. Like they look obvious and weird, um, but you won't see them nearly as much once they're printed, especially since it's on the underbelly of the horse. They will look within scale then. What I like to do is do draw sharp while holding control to do the veins um, and then I take the pinch tool and I go over the shape of them to make them thinner um, and sharper and then I smooth the ends of the veins so it looks like they're dipping back down underneath the skin um, deeper and uh, I think that works really well for the veins you can see that process right there And I should be looking at a photo while I do these. These I'm just doing from memory of places where I know veins are. And I should be looking at a photo and you can chastise me for it. <laughs> but they do match the other side that I did while I was looking at a reference photo. Um, that part of the video is cut out. I did one side of the horse um, with the veins while looking at the reference. Um, especially on the belly and, and things. I, I looked at some actual pregnant mare stomach photos, uh, which you got to conveniently miss because I forgot to record that part of the video. I'm also going to add those little bumps, the whisker bumps on the horse. And they will look very sharp. Um, and too bumpy, but again, the little details don't turn out as big as they look when you're sculpting. Little wrinkles for the chin, because that's a fleshy, soft part of the horse, and when they pull that back, you get wrinkles there. Again, tightening up the face. I'm going to add a little vein in there. 
that's a really prominent vein on a horse. I love to see those. I love to paint those. I don't know why. I always add it. It's beautiful. I love it. it. Just makes their face look so much more detailed, you know? Okay, now I am going to sculpt her butthole and her horse vagina in. I'm so sorry if there are children that are watching this, but <laughs> but it's just for the realism. Just for the realism, y'all, and it's not very detailed except for the butthole. Her tail will be covering it mostly, too. But you know what? I don't know. I got tired of the briar horses, like the old ones, where you couldn't tell what gender they were. And as a trans person, I know that this is incredibly ironic, but... Here I'm looking at a reference for the leg fluffies that they get on the backs of their little legs. I love sculpting those in. They're a bitch to support because you have to support each individual spike by itself, basically. Um, so that's a bitch, but I love sculpting them. <laughs> I use the little, you know, elastic deform tool and the grab tool to make those little spikes and then I carve in with draw sharp and then I uh, build up with draw sharp um, while holding control. Uh, when you're holding control with a brush it inverts the brush so it does the opposite of what it normally does um, and I find that really really helpful. And we're coming up on the end here of where I got to with her. I still haven't finished her. Still need to do the mane and tail. So there'll probably be another video about doing the mane and tail on her. Um, maybe finishing up the baby, but I, I might not record that. Um, I do want to do that new video with Bronte soon. Um, so that's going to be fun and exciting. And uh, I've really enjoyed getting feedback on these videos and helping people out and everything like that and i just want you guys to know that i appreciate your support for my work and i appreciate um all the love for my art and everything like that uh my new website is up right now it's breakthemoldstudios.com um you can see it on the screen right now um, you can follow me on Instagram follow me on Facebook but um, I have some sculptures for sale up on my website right now I have some painted pieces I have some uh, second quality reduced price copies uh, with little bubbles or a cracked ear or um, little squishing from the printer and uh, I know a lot of you guys like the bargains <laughs> so I try to keep putting more of those up um, yeah you can go see galleries of my work as well uh, my pieces that other people have painted which is really exciting for me sorry for the trucks in the background um, I really appreciate if you've listened all this way and uh, I'm glad you enjoy hearing me talk you guys have a good day and I hope you'll subscribe so that you can see my next video. Uh, goodbye! <laughs>